if your TLDR <laughs> TLDR is too long, didn't read. <laughs> oh, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Doc Talk, where we talk to a doc about all the things you want to talk to a doc about. Great. <laughs> um, we're really excited today to jump into a topic top of mind for everyone, I think, which is um, the reproductive health from the Gen Z point of view, or POV, as the kids say. Um, we want to talk about everything from fertility anxiety, egg freezing in your 20s, the rise of AI ovulation tracking, mm -hmm. um, new approaches to contraception, or just questions about contraception. Joining me is our chief medical officer, Dr. Janet Choi. Fertility anxiety, let's mm -hmm. jump in right there first. 45% uh, of Gen Zers are more likely to use social searching um, on sites like TikTok and Instagram instead of Google. Um, and that is compared to about 35% of millennials, even as Gen Zs grow older. They've increasingly relied on social media mm -hmm. um, as their primary search engine. So they're not like going to Dr. Google anymore, they're going to Dr. TikTok. Or, or Wikipedia. Or Wikipedia, yeah. I don't think people did that, but yes. Have we entered an era where we can address medical advice we hear from real doctors on social media? It depends on the resource. Yep. And this is really important because there are lots of supposed experts um, who are kind of spouting all this sometimes not really factual information and it actually could be harmful. So it's really, really important that you um, vet and discern which of the social media resources that you turn to for like, you know, friendly and reliable advice. So we were just talking before the camera started rolling, Les and I, and we were thinking about our vast network of providers whom we have vetted and we have checked that they are OBGYN board certified, and they've done their three-year additional postgraduate fellowship training in reproductive endocrine and infertility, super important, um, where we are obliged to do a lot of research and clinical learning and training so we can take care of your fertility most appropriately. So there are a number of our providers who actually have some really great social media websites or places on Insta and Insta. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and TikTok. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, Dr. Lucky Seacon here based in New York. Um, Dr. Jamie Notman, she has something called A Fertile Future. She also mm -hmm. can sort of insert li little bits and tidbits about exercise advice too, because she's really kind of held out on that. Um, Dr. Laura Shaheen Dr. Laura in Shaheen. Seattle. Yep. Uh, Dr. Allison Rogers in Chicago has a really vast yep. following. Um, Dr. Kelly Beck, part of our provider network mm -hmm. out in LA. And there are a few others also out there. Again, I have looked at their sites. The information they share on their sites are quite dependable and reliable. Again, doesn't substitute for medical advice for your personal needs, but it's a good launching off pad and um, again, trustworthy. Yeah, so the TLDR is, mm -hmm. um, if your- TLDR. <laughs> The, the summary, TLDR is too long, didn't read. Oh, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on. The, T <laughs> the TLDR <laughs> is if you're, if you're following a physician who s you've insured specializes in the thing they're talking about, so in this case we're talking about fertility, mm -hmm. and they are providing you like evidence-based sound advice, then that's something you could trust. Yeah. And through progeny.com, and we have sites on YouTube and our own um, website that has education, that would other also be a very good resource around fertility mm -hmm. because everything we put out is vetted by physicians, um, is signed up by you and mm -hmm. other physicians in our network. Um, and so that would be another really good right. resource. And this is infertility, the podcast, even though it says this is infertility in the title, it's also appropriate some of the topics that we cover there um, with our providers in our network actually kind of go in depth into areas that might be appealing to someone who's maybe not worried about their fertility per se, but maybe in a few years, like let's talk about fertility preservation or how do I suss out my fertility? Yep. So great resources to look into. Agreed. And so has social media impacted our anxiety? The answer is yes. Um, All those stupid algorithms. Yes. Like why do I keep on getting fuzzy sweaters from like, you know, Because they know you're stressed. I know, right? Yeah. Or need to go to Scandinavia. <laughs> so I think that we have a lot of access mm -hmm. to a lot of information. I think it's hard to discern sometimes what's true and what isn't. Nearly half of Gen Z is worried about their fertility, despite not currently trying to conceive. So not people who are diagnosed with infertility as it were, but just worried about it in general. And this comes from a 2023 survey from mm -hmm. HRC Fertility, which is a network of clinics out west in California. Um, and it said nearly half of young people ages 16 to 24 also have fertility anxiety, mm. which is another study from April. 
Um, and so Gen Zers are planning to have kids mostly in their 30s. If they have fertility anxiety, if they have access to things like fertility preservation, as an as an example, mm-hmm. um, what is an appropriate age to start considering elective egg freezing? Um, that is a great question. And I'd say once you've had some time to think about it, and if you have the benefits especially, so it's not gonna break the bank because it is it is a pretty costly process if you mm-hmm. have to pay for it out of pocket. But I'd say if you feel ready and committed to the idea of this, because um, it does involve some medical procedures, yep. I'd say probably for most women who are thinking about it, most individuals with ovaries in your 20s would be ideal, mid, late 20s. Mm-hmm. Now, again, This may not pertain to you. So for instance, let's say you have a personal history where all the women in your family had menopause before the age of 50. It's not a guarantee you're gonna have the same issue, not a guarantee that you're gonna have future infertility, but you may wanna look into it sooner then because maybe your ovaries are on track to age a little faster, Mm -hmm. right, given that family history. So it really depends on that, but I'd say in the most part, for the most part, 20s, early mid 30s would be ideal. Yep, and we like to say talking isn't doing, so a good place to start. Also, if you have concerns about your own fertility, your options for family building in the future, schedule an initial consult with a reproductive endocrinologist or a fertility specialist and just have the conversation. They can offer some basic testing and let you know sort of where you are. Right. Um, it doesn't mean you have to jump to any sort of treatment or any medical procedures. It's just a conversation with a 100%. specialist. 100%. So I think that some people are like want some answers about their body, but they're a little bit worried that if they go see a reproductive endocrinologist, which is the kind of specialist you really should be seeing for these to sort these kind of questions out, that they're going to be compelled to do some sort of treatment and that's not the case. Yep. Agreed. Um, let's move right along to AI ovulation tracking, okay. which sounds really exciting. Yeah, so. um, we've heard of ovulation tra- tracking apps mm-hmm. like um, we know Apple Watch, Fitbit, um, and there's a new trending ovulation tracker. It's natural cycles plus the aura ring. It's that ring that people wear to track their biometrics yeah. like sleep and things like that. Um, it's a smart ring that ch- can track biometrics, as I said, and provides insights to help you improve your health. Um, natural cycles, <laughs> where so, someone in the room is telling someone us. Someone is not fertile right someone now. Someone is not fertile right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, someone is super fertile, but took a put <laughs> full up the ad. <laughs> Now. By the way, just to be really clear, there is no app that's going to tell you whether or not you're fertile, like big picture or not fertile, but it'll tell you if, you know, this day of the month yes. of your menstrual cycle is a fertile window to try to conceive or not try to conceive. Correct. <laughs> that wasn't a diagnosis. Um, yes, let's be clear here. <laughs> so the natural cycles feature can act as what what people are saying, natural birth control, using the aura ring, using a woman's basal body temperature Mm -hmm. and menstrual cycle information, so first day of last menstrual cycle, to predict when she may be fertile or not fertile if we're talking about birth control. And it is FDA approved for this reason, which is, it just means it's an FDA approved medical device usually. The ring sensors generate 1,400 data points daily and can measure temperature changes mm-hmm. as precisely as point two, as point twenty three degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, but I have to just interject there because I love the concept. Sorry for cutting you off. Let I'm me feeling... get to the question. Oh my gosh. <laughs> OMG. Okay. You Sorry. Were, <laughs> you were really Clyde. excited about yeah, this I got one. really kind of jacked up. But let's so see. here's the question. Is ovulation tracking a viable form of birth control? It depends. Meaning... <laughs> Because ovulation tracking, when we're talking about temperature tracking, mm-hmm. if you're using this for, are we talking about contraception or mm-hmm. for, okay. So for contraception. We're talking about both, but let's start with contraception. So let's say with contraception, if it's super, super important to you, like you would be devastated if you were to get pregnant right now. Or you live in a state where you don't have oh. full access to reproductive options. Correct, right. Regardless, if you re- if your goal is to really avoid trying to get pregnant um, for the next, you know, month, two, three years, uh, I would not would not advise using ovulation tracking as the sole contraceptive measure in your day-to-day routine. I would agree with that. Because uh, I just looked at these stats again. When you look at different kind of forms of contraception, ovulation tracking, um, for every 100 women who are doing this, 24 to 25 of them will get pregnant within one year if they're using this. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not laughing at this. I would never, ever recommend yes. this solely. There are a lot of options for contraception, 
And this is one way to understand information about your cycle, and that there's value there, right. right? Or your cycle's regular, all of these things. But we both are saying don't use things like the Aura Ring or Fitbit as your only method Correct. of contraception. Um, for the opposite, mm -hmm. so for tracking to try to become pregnant, right. there the gold standard typically, would you agree, is ovulation predictor kits. You pee on a stick. It tells you how much LH is in your urine, which tells you when you're ovulating or about to ovulate. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's that's sort of the gold standard. Right. Um, would you agree that for regular cycles, people who are otherwise healthy, starting to time intercourse using some of these ovulation tracking is probably reasonable? I think that's probably okay if you're just getting going with your family building mm -hmm. process. Really, the true gold standard is like going to a doctor's office like mm -hmm. daily and getting your hormone levels checked, which is really kind of quite onerous and burdensome and not really practical. So if you have very regular cycles, 28, 32, 34-day cycles pretty regularly, then those ovulation predictor kits might be usable. And again, I don't think really harmful except for the cost of buying them, Yep. right? And again, the tricky thing with the temperature charting is, especially if you're trying to use this as your sole contraceptive measure, is remember that temperature will only go up after your egg has ovulated. So if you've had, if you thought that you could wait and just have unprotected intercourse until you know, after your temperature rose, there's a chance that you could end up getting pregnant because egg releases, temperature goes up about a day later, um, and, and you might have conceived that month, mm -hmm. right? Um, it does look like Aura's talking about like what we're talking about, body literacy, understanding like your own cycles, and mm -hmm. so that's good. Aura's Women's Health Senior Product Manager, Dr. Netta Gottlieb mm -hmm. said, one of the things I repeatedly hear from fertility clinicians is how stressful it is for their patients to actively track their fertile window. We created the fertile window feature to help minimize the stress with passive tracking and empower women's uh, empower women through self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding your cycles is a good thing. Yeah, I think yeah. it's not a bad idea, especially at the beginning, just to get a better understanding of how your body works compared to say your friend or your sisters or some other relative. Okay. Yeah, and we have for, uh, for Progeny members a really great resource if you are starting to think about conceiving, not really sure how to get started. We've been in this space for a long time mm -hmm. and had many, many conversations with people who really don't know where to start. Right. Um, and so if you're a Progeny member and you're even not ready for a fertility clinic, we get that. Um, you have access to our preconception program where you can get matched with a nurse who will help walk you through some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, and it's a great resource which is free for you if yeah. you're a Progeny member where you can just call up anytime and ask to talk to a patient care advocate. Yep. And they can give you some healthy tips to try to optimize your fertility journey um, with our preconception program. Yeah, trying to conceive. Just mm -hmm. that sort of, I like the phrase body literacy. Yeah, I do too. One. Yeah. TTC, trying TTC. to conceive. Okay. Um, okay, now we're gonna jump on to our last topic for today's mm -hmm. Doc Talk, which is new age contraception. Mm -hmm. It sounds like hippie birth okay. control. Um, okay, <laughs> a study from WISP, a sexual and reproductive telehealth provider, said that 22% of sexually active women are now using cycle tracking. Uh-oh, we're back. We're back to our topic. Um, as their we're means cycling of back <laughs> to cycle tracking. <laughs> <laughs> um, as their means of contraception. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've all, we've covered this uh, pretty, pretty well. We don't yeah. recommend that as a means of contraception. Correct. But, um, this study also said the most popular method of birth control, of contraception, is the oral birth control pill. Mm -hmm. um, and so curious, how long is oral birth control um, uh, sustainable? So how long can one be on it? I mean, technically, if you don't have any other health things that are cropping up, if the birth control pills aren't causing side effects or some like medical complications, migraines, nuance, yep. that, for instance, blood clots, rare. And if you feel good about it and you're able to take it every day, yeah. then you can take it for as long as you want. The tricky thing, and you and I have seen this in the fertility clinics, is sometimes people come in having been on the birth control pill and they've been so compliant for, for like more than a decade. And now they're in their late 30s and they're like, oh, my periods are regular. And then we have to hit pause and say, your periods are regular because basically the pill is giving you a regular period right. every month when right. you withdraw, right? So and so birth can control, mask yeah. perimenopausal changes too, which yeah. is actually the, the tricky thing. There. Yep. Um, so birth control pill, overwhelmingly healthy, or, or safe, mm -hmm. rather. Um, it is also prescribed for things other than contraception, yep. like helping with symptoms of PCOS, endometriosis, a number of other PMDD things. PMDD in certain cases, yep, right? Yeah, PMDD. And yep. in perimenopause can be prescribed also to help regulate those fluctuations. Mm -hmm. There's a 
myth out there that I see on TikTok where they say that birth control pill causes for infertility. You would say that's no. not that's a big no. What does happen is what you just talked about. It can mask things because you're getting a regular cycle. Right. Um, it doesn't affect your fertility in the long term, the no. birth control pill, and it is overwhelmingly safe. Right. True. Yeah. 100%. For most people. And it actually may decrease your risk of ovarian cancer, too, because yeah. sometimes people worry about that also later on in life. Now, here's really one important factor, and I want to highlight this. It's actually in print and red here. Yep. Is that, remember, even if you take the birth control pill very reliably, it is helping you stave off and prevent pregnancy, mm -hmm. but it is not serving as a barrier protecting you from STI, sexually mm -hmm. transmitted which infections. Which is a nice segue to our next topic, which is um, that condom sales are at a, like, ever time low or I, all I time need to low. Talk to my boys. You yeah. do. <laughs> um, so I am curious to hear from the doctor why this might be concerning. Right. I have ideas. So again, you can't just take one fact point and sort of extrapolate too much. So condom yep. sales down suggest to me either one, pe less people are having sex. Possible. Right? Penetrative sex. Um, or they are still, but now they're thinking, well, because I'm doing natural cycle tracking or because I'm on the pill or on the IUD, I don't need to worry about anything else. And I always tell individuals that even if you're using, honestly, ideally, if, even if you're using an IUD, mm -hmm. birth control pill, same sex female relationship, mm -hmm. for instance, you want to make sure that you're guarding yourself against getting chlamydia, which is a very sneaky little bacteria, oftentimes no symptoms and yet it can actually really badly affect your future fertility by causing tubal disease and yeah. things and you may not find out for years later. Yeah, so STD, STI protection mm -hmm. is usually a barrier contraception or a condom is usually recommended. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are using birth control to avoid pregnancy and not STDs, STIs, that's not safe. Right. That was a nice little summary. I so and we are very much invested in making sure that you protect your pres present day health and future health. Yeah. And fertility in particular is yep. affected or can be affected by STDs and STIs. Yep. Um, about 14% of women aged 18 to 45 faced mm -hmm. barriers accessing emergency contraception like Plan B mm -hmm. in the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, Gen Z in particular struggled to access emergency contraception, the study said. Yeah. Um, and so can you give us a brief explanation of what is emergency contraception and Plan B in particular? So Plan B is uh, basically a progesterone, synthetic progesterone levonorgestrel in a pill form. You can buy it at some places at pharmacies without a prescription. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can get it from Planned Parenthood as well. Mm -hmm. And it is effective, not 100%, but let's say you have an unprotected active intercourse, you know, vaginally where there's a chance you could get pregnant and you have not yet ovulated. This is a tricky thing. And if you can get your hands on the Plan B within three to five days of that unprotected intercourse mm -hmm. act, it actually dramatically lowers your chance of getting pregnant. It's um, essentially like a high dose of the birth control right. pill, correct? And, and just to More be very clear, given unfortunately, you know, the state laws mm -hmm. and rules, this doesn't cause a termination of pregnancy. It basically just changes your uterine lining so it's less friendly. Um, and also can prevent you from releasing. You know, I'm and, imagining you know. like a really pissed off endometrial <laughs> lining. <really> hostile <laughs> uterus, right? Um, no, but it also keeps you from ovulating, from releasing that egg. So that, that way, even if there's sperm swarming around in there, they mm -hmm. just can't find a usable egg. Yep. So myth busting that Plan B is not an abortion. Mm -hmm. um, it is safe. Yep. I will also add that ba depending on your BMI or your body mass index, um, um, plan B might not work as well for everyone. People in high uh, BMIs, it's not as effective. Excellent point. So yeah. again, Ella, I don't know how broadly available it is. It's mm -hmm. another form of mm -hmm. emergency contraception that is also very effective. And getting an IUD insertion, again, through your gynecologist or mm -hmm. through your Planned Parenthood provider can actually also serve as emergency contraception. And give you future contraception. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so if you need plan B, I would also recommend getting STD, STI testing mm -hmm. to make sure that you weren't also inadvertently exposed to um, sexually transmitted diseases yep. and infections. Syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, yep. hepatitis. Um, yep. But generally, again, plan B overwhelmingly safe. Yep. I love doc talking with you. This was great. Right? Right. And again, condoms, barrier protection, words of the day. Can I say one last thing? Please. Sure. The Plan B thing is shocking because people my age think that you can only take Plan B three times in your life or else your fertility's cooked. No, no, not at all. Wait, guys, you can take Plan B more than three times and it doesn't affect your fertility. Guys, ladies, others, they, people. them, yes, people. People, yeah. Yeah, okay. yes. it does not cook anything. I mean, I, it does not. 
It's just progesterone. Yeah. I'll spread the word. 